Tuesday. Let's get started this morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for another day of life. Thank you for filling us with energy. Thank you for giving us a passion for you and your word. And as we come together this morning, bless our time abundantly, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yesterday I shared with you how that I'm obsessed with aviation and I showed you this illustration of how that every flight begins at the end of a runway and as it progresses down that runway it hits point on the runway known as V1. It's the uh, point of no return. The pilot has to make the decision whether to continue the journey and get airborne or to abort and safely get to the end of the runway and hopefully not into the ocean or into a fence or something else. And I suggested yesterday that every one of us have a point of no return in our experience. And so yesterday I started introducing you to that point of no return in my life. But we're all hoping for passing that point of no return, passing the rotate, passing V2 and getting airborne. That's what we're hoping for. Yesterday I shared with you that looking back on my life I can see there were three defining moments. The first was in that nightclub, that shadowy figure in the mirror with that overwhelming impression that I was it. Then there was the, uh, the storm in the field down south of Brisbane. And how the, there were those three distinctive thoughts. One, if there is an end to the world, it'll probably start with this sort of scene. And two, if there is a God, then you're lost. And three, just to be sure, here's all the things you've done wrong in your life. Very, very confronting to say the least. And then the third defining moment that happened shortly after was the events of September 11, 2001. After pretty much instantly, we started seeing talk of war. The American president at the time, George W. Bush, started making his case for a war on terror. It was a really interesting war because there was no direct enemy. It's an enemy that could go across borders of countries, geographically, socio-economic. It was the war on terror. But while this was being announced in the Western Hemisphere, right here, the very next day in Australia, our second airline carrier went bankrupt, and said Australia. Now, the company that I was working for as a programmer happened to be doing the redevelopment of the ANSET terminal in Sydney Domestic Airport. And instantly, the company I was working for had billions of dollars wiped off their stock value, which was the basis for my retirement plan. So my overall strategy disappeared within the space of two days of September 11. It was very difficult to comprehend how events at back then could happen in one part of the world and affect my bank balance and my future security. But that wasn't all. Next we saw this scare of anthrax being mailed to senators around the United States. 
and everyone started going, what is this? There's no end of this terror. It's everywhere. And shortly after that, the invasion began. First Afghanistan, then Iraq, and the rest is history, as they say. The longest war fought by the Americans only ended, I think it was last year in August, the 20-year war on terror. So as I shared yesterday, looking at what was happening in the world through the lens of a non-believer, it was pretty self-evident, at least in my estimation of things, that we were dealing with religions at war with each other. Despite what they were telling us, this isn't a religious war, we're not picking on Islamic people. But nonetheless, it was God bless America and Allah Akbar over here, and they were both going to combat. And whoever prevailed would obviously be the prevailing God. And so as I shared yesterday, I turned my attention to what do these people of faith, what do they actually believe about the end? Because perhaps, just perhaps, they may actually self-fulfill their own predictions. And so I turned my attention to their, their sacred text, as they refer to it, the Quran. What does the Quran teach? What does the Islamic mind think? When they read the Quran, what are they preparing for? What do they think will happen in the future? And it was profoundly insightful to read the Quran. Then I turned my attention to the Hindus. The Hindus have one of the oldest religions on earth, at least that's their claim. But when you read through there, there's not a whole lot about what happens in the future, except when you die, if you're good, you'll come back better. If you're bad, you'll come back worse. So I turned my attention to Buddha because Buddha was in the Buddhist, uh, sorry, Buddha was in the Hindu uh, world view, and then he recognized there was a failure there. So if Buddha recognized there was a failure and he created a whole new religion, well, what does Buddha have to say? Buddha have to, has to say that the solution in um, the Vedas is not clear enough for the average person to experience the freedom from attachment. And so Buddha comes up with a new framework. And it, it sounds good, it looks good, it even feels good, but if you don't have the discipline to do it, it's actually pretty depressing. Many of my Buddhist friends back in Asia, I would ask them, so Buddha reached enlightenment, right? Oh yes, yes, yes. Has anybody reached enlightenment since? No. Are you? I don't, I'm, I'm not disciplined enough. So what hope is there? Well, we just keep trying. So I turned my attention to Christianity, or Judaism, first of all, and then Christianity. And as I shared yesterday, amongst the many things that I had read, I came across this passage, which I'll share with you once more, where the author of the text claims to be speaking through Isaiah. Isaiah claims that this is God speaking, his God, El. And L claims to say here that he is the only L, which is the only God, and there's no other God and there's nothing like him. A claim that we don't see in any other religious text. And so as I suggested yesterday, that's great, that's impressive, that's courageous, but that's not convincing unless there is evidence for that claim. And as I suggested yesterday, the very next verse emphasizes here's the way you'll know my claim is solid and that is I'm going to tell you something that is impossible for humans to do and that is to tell you future events before they happen and so he places the the, uh, the challenge on the table are you serious about wanting to know if God exists or not because if you are there's a challenge if you're not Go take your red pill and enjoy the rest of your life. My problem was that I've had these three encounters or defining moments that challenged the way I saw the world as a non-believer. And so this presented itself as not just a challenge, but an opportunity to get to the bottom of something. And so as I suggested yesterday, this claim is testable. The claim is there's no other God except the author of this text. The evidence for that claim is, I'll tell you what will happen before it happens, and you know that I, if I get this right, you know I'm different to everybody else. Because 3% of you can tell the future, 
fluke it. And 16%, well not 3% of you, but most of you can only do 3%, and some of you, I hope none of you here can do 16%, because that means you're messing around the wrong industry. And so when we take this, this approach, well if prophecy is the key to test the supernatural, and we fly, uh, uh, put that matrix across the other worldviews, you end up with this schematic, which is basically Christianity offers the, the, uh, the real testing ground. 30 to 40 percent of the text is prophecy, which means that 30 or 40 percent of the text is a test for the evidence of the existence of God. And so, as I said yesterday, there are uh, 1,817 prophecies in the entire Bible. There's 1,239 in the Old Testament, the rest are in the New Testament. Now, that's a lot of prophecies, isn't it? And most of us here as Seventh-day Adventists, we probably know about five of these easily. We could talk about Daniel 2, right? We all know Daniel 2. The Mark of the Beast, maybe. And yet God has given us, as Bible students... 1,817 opportunities to test his existence. It, it befuddles me that we have people in our church, even young people walking around going, well, we don't really know if God exists. You're just confessing your ignorance to Scripture. Study it out. The evidence is there. Test the evidence. So I, I shared with you one yesterday of the 1,817 prophecies, and that is the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. A profound prophecy because it saw a fulfillment to the prophecy 200 years after, or the start of the fulfillment, 200 years after its initial giving. And it was seen as being fulfilled by the very person it was predicting to fulfill, Alexander the Great. I find it remarkable that Alexander the Great is in the story in terms of being the first king of Greece and Greece is mentioned by name. And he comes along and goes, wow, I see myself in the story here. And as a result of that, today, if you study theology and you study the Old Testament in Greek, you are using the very translation that that prophecy commissioned. It's absolutely phenomenal. Profound prophecy. We saw yesterday there are 13 predictive elements. That means 13 things have to happen for that one prophecy to be fulfilled. 13 things. That's like getting 13 20 cent pieces all in a line, throwing them all up at the same time, and correctly going, that one will be heads, tails, heads, heads, tails, tails, heads, heads, tails, and getting it perfect on the first attempt. It's statistically improbable. Or it's divine. It's a profound insight. And so as I shared with you yesterday, here are some of the elements of that particular prophecy. And uh, I concluded with the thought that for me, when you look at the claim that the author is God, the only God, and he says, here's the evidence. I'm going to tell you the things that happened before they happen. And no matter what happens, my counsel will stand. No one can change what I've predicted. And when you come to that, you have to realize, looking at history compared to the prophecy, which are centuries apart, you have to conclude that either somehow it's a complete hoax, meaning the only way it can be a hoax is if the prophecy was written after the events. But the problem is, in this particular prophecy, that is impossible because Alexander the Great was given the prophecies before they fulfilled, proving the 6th century B.C claim that the book of Daniel was written in the 6th century BC. So either it's a hoax, which, which all the evidence suggests that's impossible. And if it's not a hoax, then you're left with one other option, which is, it's supernatural. But that's only one of the 1,817 prophecies. I went to another prophecy next. The second prophecy. We're not going to do all 1,817 prophecies. Don't worry. It'd be fun we might be here for a while. But here's just another one. And you all know this one very, very well. But I want you to see it in the lens of what we're talking about. We go to Daniel once again. And by the way, the reason I like Daniel in looking at prophecies in this lens is because it's clearly provable that it's a 6th century BC document. 
We have the style of the script to support that. We have the fact that Alexander the Great was given a copy 200 years after it was written, a fact. We also have them found, there's many copies of the Book of Daniel amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date back because of the, um, the, the carbon dating of the script that they're written on, the, the animal skins and things, the parchments. They date back to 200 to 150 BC. And they're copies of copies of copies. And the fact that Jesus himself, in uh, um, 30 AD, 31 AD, he comes out and he says, if you want to know what's going to happen, go study the book of Daniel. So even Jesus pointed to the fact that Daniel was written way before him. So all the evidence is clear that the book of Daniel is an older book than the, the predictions it makes. So when we come to the uh, second chapter of Daniel, which you all know back to front, right? Okay, clearly you don't. We'll go through it step by step then. No, we're not going to do that. When we come to the book of Daniel, and then go to chapter 2, you're familiar with the story, despite your lack of enthusiasm. The story is, the king can't sleep, correct? And he wakes up. And he's had a dream, and he's almost to the point where it's terrifying. Why? Because we know now, based on archaeology, that the Babylonians had these things called dream omen tablets, little clay tablets with the inscriptions on them. And the belief we understand now from archaeology is, is that the Babylonians believed that dreams were from the gods. And the dreams from the gods were to tell what was going to happen to the future, whether it was to the king specifically, his family, or the nation. So you imagine, if you believed that dreams were a message and revelation from the gods, if you received a dream, it woke you up, and then you can't remember, what have you just done? You've just lost the message from who? From God. Or gods. So you know the story, he calls for the wise men, Daniel's not included in that, that camp, they can't do it, they say no one's ever been able to do this, so then he gets angry, he commands everyone to be killed, Daniel goes to get executed, Daniel says, hey wait, why is this thing so hasty? He goes and sees the king and says, king you want the interpretation, my God can give it to you. The king really does want the interpretation, so he's like, okay, I'll give you time. He goes back and he does what we would all do, and that is pray. And it's remarkable in the story. Like, if you're reading this as a non-believer, it's a, it's a very, you know, it's, it'd make a great movie. Because not only does this guy go, hey, my God can do it. He goes that night and he prays with his friends, he goes to sleep, and he gets the dream. Now, it sounds far-fetched, it sounds like a perfect fairy tale. Except that when Daniel wakes up, he says that God gave him the dream that the king got, he goes to the king and says that, that his God gave him the dream. So what comes next out of Daniel's mouth is the claim that God is telling the future, not Daniel. So that makes it what? Testable. Remember the claim? I am God, there's no one else. How will you know? I'll tell you the future. So now we have a testable um, piece of evidence here in chapter 2. The, the claim is, is that God of heaven... The God, El, or Elohim, gave this prediction. So Daniel goes to Nebuchadnezzar and he says, Listen, here's what you dreamt. You know the story well, the golden head, the silver chest, blah, 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 feet. And the great big rock comes at the end. The king seems to connect with that. That's what I dreamt. But then Daniel goes exactly straight to what the king wants, which is, here's the interpretation. And he says, Listen, that golden head, that's who? Come on now. Wow, I didn't hear anything right. What did I hear? Babylon. Babylon. All right. Are you sure? Yeah. All right. Why? Because Daniel says, you are the golden head. You're Babylon. But then he says next what? After you, there will be a? Another kingdom, a? Inferior kingdom, right? Now, the cool thing with Daniel 2 is, is when you compare it to Daniel chapter 8, is that you know who that next kingdom is by name. It's Medo-Persia. Because that's the ram. But what happens after the silver in the dream? Um, Daniel says, but after that there will be a third kingdom 
inferior again. And who was that third kingdom based in Daniel chapter 8? It's Greece, by name. So then, it goes on and says, then there'll be a fourth kingdom, iron. Rule like a rod of iron. Now, it doesn't mention Rome in the book of Daniel. But we know after Greece came Rome. And the interesting thing, as I'm sure you all know, because you're good Bible students, you've been followers of Jesus longer than I have. I'm sure most of you. You have gray hair more than me. So I'm sure you recognize that Babylon was famous for gold. Medo Persia was famous for its use of. Greece was famous for its use of. And Rome was famous for its use of. It's pretty interesting, isn't it? Like, God just gives you so many different things to go, you can't screw this up. Then he goes, really interestingly, that the fourth kingdom doesn't get conquered by another. What does it specifically say about it? It's divided. Now, when you look in the history of the world, nearly every single time, kingdoms are replaced by other kingdoms. And that king was replaced by another king. That king was replaced. And, you know, we live in a society today, and this might be controversial, but, you know, I don't really care. Everyone right now, for some weird reason, in the Western society, and even in the, in, in the East, are whinging and whining about what's happened in the past. And that somehow that we need to pay reparations for people who happened in the past. Well, how far back do you want to go? Because my people were invaded by another people, their people were invaded by another people, their people were invaded by... How far back do you want to go? The Babylonians were invaded by the Middle Persians. Should the Middle Persians pay representation to the Babylonians? And the pattern keeps going down. We live in a broken creation. So here we have this problem in this prophecy that it says that Rome, that, that fourth kingdom, is not going to be conquered by anyone. It's going to collapse. Now this is astounding because there's only one hand and glove fit for this in prophecy. And you know who it is. It's Rome dividing into the ten divisions. So when you line up what this prophecy says compared to what happened in history, it is profound. Now I know you will like to use it in your evangelistic series on night number one to give you credibility. But put that to a side for a second. Nothing wrong with that. But have you outgrown Daniel too? Because I feel like many of you have. And you think that this is some time a thing for the old... No, this is evidence that God wants you to know that He is the only God. And that has serious implications for your point of no return. So, in the story, this fourth empire, which we believe to be Rome, it collapses and divides into ten. Alright, it's in ten now. Then it makes a bizarre prediction and says that these ten will try and cleave to each other. They'll try and come back one to another. But then it even describes how they will try and do it through marriage. They'll try and do it through coercion. They'll try and do it through force. All these different things. And yet the prophecy, according to Daniel from God, says they will not cleave one to another. Now you all know this stuff from your, your first day in Adventism, don't you? You go through some of the people that try to do this. Who are they? Charlemagne? Well, you got one. Where's the rest of them? Napoleon. Kaiser Wilhelm, who else? Do you need a Daniel 2 prophecy again? A seminar again? Who, who else? Come on. Napoleon. Napoleon, thank you. Who else? Hitler. Hitler, very good. So there's a number of individuals that have tried to bring Europe back together. It's all failed. More recently, the United or uh, well, European Union has tried to unite Europe. And yet they still can't cleave one to another. They hate each other. They're just barely holding on. There was going to be Grexit. That didn't work. And then Brexit happened and that one, ha that one did work. And then they were talking about some other ones. And Anyway, it's, it's a, just a mess. Now the cool thing with this prophecy is, is that it's in that particular environment that the great big rock comes. Okay, that was your chance to go, Amen. <laughs> you know what the big rock is, right? What is it? And you weren't amening? What's your name? 
Seventh day what? And you didn't amen about the rock. You'll get it right next time. Okay, so watch this. The environment that Daniel is describing here to King Nebuchadnezzar is the time in which we're living right now. And it's this time that the rock comes. Amen. Which means when you look at the predictive elements, there are seven elements in this prophecy. There are seven things that have to happen for this prediction to be fulfilled. One prophecy to be fulfilled means seven things to fulfill. Number one, Babylon, obviously, will fall to me to Persia. Me to Persia falls to Greece. Oh, that was too fast. Let's go back. You get the idea anyway. You get down to number five, Rome divides into what we call today Western Europe. Number six, they try to unite, but they fail every single time. And number seven, There's only three real Adventists in this room. That's what you call the remnant. Now, I'm just messing with you. Listen, this is profound. If you were a betting person, and I sure hope you're not in some respects, but if you were, if you saw that there was the odds of seven things fulfilling in that sequence, in that order, and Number one fulfilled, exactly as it said. Number two fulfilled, number three, number four, all the way down to number six. And you came to the table right at this point. You've seen the six of the predictions are spot on. There's one more prediction to go to fulfill the prophecy. What do you think the chances are that number seven will fulfill as well? You are betting men and women. I looked at this and I said, are you kidding me? There's 140 words in this prophecy, because I count numbers. There's 140 words in this prophecy, and it predicts 2,600 years worth of history. Six of the predicted elements are done. There's only one left, and that's the second coming of Jesus. And so at this point, if you were really seriously gambling... You would place all your bets that the second coming will happen. If you don't, then you are really, really conservative. You don't want to lose any money. I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to say that I bet the second coming will happen based on the evidence. So this again leads me to another conclusion. Either Daniel 2 is a hoax. Somehow it was written after everything happened and snuck there into the manuscripts. The problem is we've got copies of the manuscripts in the Dead Sea Scrolls that were copies before even the last events happened. Rome was still in power. Well, actually, no. Greece was still in power when we got the, the oldest Dead Sea Scroll copy. After that copy was made of the Dead Sea Scroll in 200 B.C., Greece collapses, Rome comes up, Rome goes along, Rome divides, and up comes divided Europe, and they're squabbling and marrying and not happening, and they're still in that state centuries after we got copies from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So could it be a hoax that it was written after it all happened? Impossible. Absolutely impossible. So if it's not a hoax, then it must be supernatural. Which is again the claim of the author. The author of the Bible says, I'm God, there's no one else. And here's how I'll tell you. I'll tell you 2,600 years worth of history before it happens. And when it happens, you'll know. And yet somehow, you do that on night one of your evangelistic series that you came in to know the message. And then you forgot. And now you sit around going, well, I wonder what's happening with God. Wake up. Because this prophecy tells me that if God knows the future, which is what Daniel's claiming to King Nebuchadnezzar, he says, Nebuchadnezzar, God knows the future. And the point of this prophecy is, is that if God knows the future, then he knows my future. Does that make sense? And by implication, he knows yours as well. He knows every detail of your existence. Whether you're an atheist or not. 
whether you're a liberal or a conservative or an actual Seventh-day Adventist. You got that, right? He knows you. And if he knows you, then the question is, what does he want you to know? See, here's the point I'm going to... I'm going to try and emphasize for the next three sessions we've got. How much of the Bible is approximately prophecy? Do you remember? Between 30 to 40 percent, depending on how you divide and if you count things twice or whatever, but 30 to 40 percent. So if I open up my Bible and I take, say, one third, all right? So there's one third. If I take one third of my Bible, so you can see it like this. This is roughly how much of this book is prophecies. What did God say the function of the prophecies are? What was his point? You study the prophecies, you will what? Know that he is God. Which God? The only one. That's a good hunk of the book, isn't it? Yes or no? Oh, come on, be enthusiastic. Yes or no? All right. So here's my million dollar question to you. If this much of the book is God trying to prove to you that He exists, what's this part for? Ah, someone said it. What? The rest of it is Him wanting you to have a relationship with Him. This part here is to get your attention and to give you enough evidence that you're a thinking Christian. You're a thinking believer. You don't have dumb faith. You don't have blind faith. You have solid faith. And once you've got that, now God goes, good, put that to the side for a second. Now we establish that I exist. I mean, it took you a while, but here I am. Now let's have a chat with the rest of the 60% of the book. We're going to touch on some of that in the next three sessions. So, what does a non-believer do with this reality? Well, I did a couple of other prophecies, which we won't do tonight, or today. And as I did those prophecies, like there's one, one collection of prophecies around the historical existence or evidence in terms of prophecy for the existence of Jesus of Nazareth being the Messiah. So Messianic prophecies. When you look at those prophecies, and there's a, about 130 of them, that group together to establish the identity of one individual out of the billions born on this planet. When you look at that, in terms of the, the predictions and then the fulfillment in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, one from Galilee 2,000 years ago, when you put those two things together, the chances of Jesus of Nazareth fulfilling just eight of the 130 prophecies is the equivalent of taking the state of New South Wales and burying it in 20 cent pieces up to a metre high. That's a lot of 20 cent pieces, right? You take one 20 cent piece, you paint it red, and you throw it somewhere in the state of New South Wales, and then I give you one chance to pull one coin out, and it has to be red. That's the chances of Jesus of Nazareth fulfilling eight of the 130 plus prophecies. So when you start going down this path of looking at prophecy being the evidence for the existence of God, you end up with overwhelming evidence for supernatural intervention in human history. So I did this. I'm still working as a programmer. I'm still going into Brisbane every day, commuting back and forward, and I'm pondering all these things. This is about an eight-month journey that I've been sharing with you so far. If there is a God, which it seems the evidence is suggesting, then the probability is, is that not only does he exist, but he knows me. Now, if he knows me, why is he trying to speak to me through these uh, defining moments in my life? Lightning storms and flashbacks of childhood memories of doing wrong things. Why? Because he wants to save you. Well, you know what I didn't know. So what I decided to do is I, I went out and I bought this. They're CDs in case you don't know what they are. 
That's the whole Bible in CD format, not MP3, CD. It's huge, and it cost a fortune, but I wanted to know something. By the way, someone asked me yesterday, what happened to your fiance? She, she uh, gave me a choice. She said, you choose God or you choose me? And I said, well, you're telling me this before we're married. What will you do after we're married? I'll choose God. But I wasn't choosing God because I want to be a Christian. I just didn't want to choose, give her the satisfaction. I chose her over something else. So she threw the ring back at me and broke off. And I haven't seen her since that day. And so I had a lot of free time now. And so all I did in my free time was immerse myself in what this Bible thing said and what it spoke about. So I got a CD. And that was my Walkman, my Sony Discman. And I would listen to the Bible randomly, just pull random things out and listen to it. So one day I was uh, in Brisbane working and there was another thunderstorm. This is a couple of months after the other one I told you about, or a few months after that. There's another thunderstorm, it was hail. And so everyone in the office was told you go home early and try and get home and get your car into the garage before the hail hits. And so that's what I did. And as I was driving home in the car, I threw a CD in and I got to the to the garage and pulled in. It was raining, but not hail at that point. And so I was interested in what I was listening to. It happened to be the, the Gospel of John. I didn't know John from, from Moses. I mean, it's all new to me. But I took the CD out and put it in my discman and went back into the house. And I'm listening to it with my headphones on. And while I'm there, this storm gets worse and worse. It's a Thursday night and there is a, a blackout. And so I'm sitting there in my lounge room looking out the window, had the curtains pulled back, looking at the lightning storm, listening to the Gospel of John in the storm with the power out. So as I'm listening, and again, I don't know this, well, this is the first time I've ever heard John. Can you remember the first time you ever read the Gospel of John? It's a pretty interesting book. It's, it's very much through the lens of the person of Jesus and, and how he's perceived and what he does and so on and so on. So as I'm listening, it gets to... Um, chapter 17. I didn't know it was chapter 17, but this is what it got to. And chapter 17, this is what the Gospel of John starts off by saying. It says, Jesus spoke these words and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. It sounds like a point of no returns being reached for Jesus. The hour has come. The defining moment has come. But notice what he says next. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son. That your son may also, or may, may son also may glorify you. And then he continues on having a conversation with the father. And now I'm listening to this, sitting there looking at the at the window at the lightning storm in the dark. I'm like, wow. Jesus progresses in his prayer, and he shifts gears in verse sixteen. He says, "I manifest your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours; you gave them to me, and they have heard my word." He's talking about the disciples. So he starts having a a conversation with the Father, and then he shifts gears, and then he says, and now I want to talk to you about the disciples. He starts praying for the disciples and saying how that they, you know, were in the world, but he's brought them out, and they listened to the word, and you've revealed your glory to them, all this stuff. And then it goes on, and it says in verse 20, I need to read on this slide because I can't see it. In verse 20, it says, I do not pray for these alone, the disciples, but also for Robbie. And I'm like, wow, I didn't know my name was in the Bible. My brother's name is Ben. My younger brother's Ben. I knew Ben was in the Bible because my mom told me. But no one told me Robbie was in the Bible, so I was curious. So I said, I do not pray for these, the disciples alone, but also for Robbie, who will believe in me through the disciples' word. I was like, who is this guy? It continues on and says that Robbie may be, what's the next word, everyone? One, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that Robbie also may be one in us. That Robbie may believe that you sent me. Up until this point in my journey, Up here, intellectually, I was like, there is evidence for the existence of God, based on what I've just shared with you. But I wouldn't have said to you, oh, I'm a believer. 
I would have said, follow the evidence. The evidence is strongly leaning towards this probability. But I didn't know who God was. Just that he was a title on a page claiming an, a position of authority and he gave evidence to support that position. But as I'm listening to this, there's a guy that has the same name as me that Jesus is praying for probably around 2,000 years ago. And he's praying that that, same, that that Robbie character will be one as you, Father, are in me and I and you, Robbie, will be in one. He's praying that Robbie will be a part of the oneness of God. As in the Godhead. And I'm just like, my mind's just going, who is this person? Why have I never heard of this Robbie? Verse 22. And the glory which you gave me. So get this. Jesus is saying, the Father gave Jesus glory. That's pretty profound, right? Okay, come on, guys. The Father gave Jesus glory. That's profound. And then that is what Jesus then says... The glory which you gave me, I, Jesus, have given to... This is day two. We only have five together, people. Come on. Get enthusiastic. Jesus says, I wish you were hot. Anyway. The glory which you give me, I'll give to Robbie. That Robbie may be one just as we are one. I mean, this is super, super interesting to me. Because I have the same name as this guy. And then it continues on. I in Robbie and you in me. That Robbie may be made perfect in one. And that Robbie may know that you have sent me. And get this. And have loved Robbie as... What's it say next? You, that's the Father, have loved me. That's Jesus. Did you get that? Clearly you didn't. But it's okay, I'm going to forgive you now because you guys are clearly... That's it. I, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> Jesus is saying that the Father loves Robbie the same way the Father loves Jesus. Okay. I was blown away with this when I heard this. It Could it be possible that... This God that I've been reading about who's made predictions and they've all come out. Could it be that that God loves this Robbie as well as that Robbie as the same as he loves Jesus? Yes. See, you're Bible students. Yes. yes. It says next, 24. Father, I desire that Robbie also whom you gave me may be with me where I am. The desire of Jesus' heart is that Robbie will be with him. I'm like, man. It continues on. That Robbie may behold my glory which you have given me, for you loved me for the foundation of the world. Verse 25. O oh, righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And get this. And Robbie has known that you sent me. And I have declared to Robbie your name. And I will declare it, that the love with which you loved me may be where? In Robbie. So it finishes. And I'm like, my head's just blown away. So I get up and I try and find a torch because the power's out. I get a Bible and I'm trying to find where this is being read from because I want to read this for myself. I'm flicking through, flicking through. Finally find it. It's John chapter 17. I'm scrolling down on my torch and there it isn't. My name's not there. It's just a bunch of, and I'm praying for them, that they will be, and that they should believe, and they have the love. But, but I'm like, no way. I heard Robbie a thousand times in that passage. So I go back to the CD. I press back. I press play again. And there it wasn't. And it was at that divinely appointed moment that I realized what had just happened. That wasn't some arbitrary dude just thrown into Jesus' prayer 2,000 years ago. That was a divine intervention in human history, in all of eternity. God sent down his, whatever he does with his angels, and he went down to that CD player. As it's reading a laser with ones and zeros coming off the disc, it goes, not change that one to zero. 
No, that's a one. That's a zero. That's a one. So that when it translates back, it, I'm telling you the technical stuff because I'm a programmer. It comes back into the audio processing unit and it gets converted to audio and goes to the headphones. Instead of hearing they, it says Robbie. Instead of hearing them, it has Robbie. Robbie, Robbie. Robbie. And the point is, is that Jesus loves me. I didn't need that, but thank you. Jesus loves me the same way that the Father loves him because the Father loves me the same. And you think you can upset me? Good luck. You come tell me you don't like me. I don't care. God loves me. You want to complain? Go ahead. I don't care. Jesus loves me. You say, but, but. You keep your butts to yourself. <laughs> Jesus loves me. The Father loves me. And Jesus wants me to be where He is. When I had this moment on a Thursday night, I did what I hope you would have done too. You fell down on your knees and you cried like a baby, even if you were 23 or 24 years of age. Do you know why? Because I met God. I met him through his son, Jesus, who prayed for me the night before he was executed. And he prayed for me by name. How do I know? You're just going to have to believe my story. He prayed for me. And it wasn't just like, oh, I'm praying for Robbie. Look at how many times he mentioned my name in that prayer. He loves me. He cares for me. He wants me to be where I am. And when he prayed this, I wasn't even a thought in my mum's eye or dad's eye or however the twinkle thing goes. I don't know how it works, but I was not even there, but he was already praying for me. And he had to wait 2,000 years for me to show up so he could tell me. Even after 23 years of being an absolute moron, thinking that I was somehow so smart, so amazing that there's no God. I had everything figured out. He had to wait patiently through the... I mean, you imagine from God's perspective. He's, he's prayed for me in Jesus' prayer 2,000 years ago, and now he's got to wait. Well, God has got to wait for the time. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating this from a human perspective, but bear with me. He's got to wait now for 2,000 years to tick down because I wasn't born in the first century, second, third, all the way down here, going, nah, still got to wait. I'm waiting to have this conversation with, G, uh, with Robbie. And he gets down here to 1978, and here I am. Boom, I'm born. Yeah, that's how old I am. And he goes, finally, Robbie's on the world stage. Now he can start, we can start building a relationship. And then I grow up to be an absolute moron. I'm going to be a big fighter. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be a millionaire. I'm gonna. He's like, oh, come on, Robbie, let's get to the point where I tell you I love you. No, I'm going to be this. I'm going to be this. Now, that's how I was. and I had an excuse. I didn't know him. What's your excuse? Because a lot of you act the same way and you claim to know him. I love you still, don't worry. So then we get down. 20 years, 23, 24 years. Jesus is just going, man, I wish we'd get through all this, this foolishness, Robbie, so that we can get to the point. And then it starts unfolding. I could imagine him getting a little bit more excited. That's how I picture Jesus anyway. He's getting excited. Here we go. Here we go. He's going, to the, he's going into that mirror in the bathroom. It's going to start happening. Here we go. I'm going to back off a little bit. Let the enemy go and scare him a little bit. Ah, okay, good. Come back. Now, splinter in the mind. Splinter in the mind. Splinter in the mind. What was that? And I think I'm solving the world's problems. No, no, no. Okay, here it comes. Here it comes. Here's the storm. Here's the storm. He's driving his car. He's, he, there would be people. To, all right, here we go. Ready? I mean, can you imagine the passion of Jesus with this? And then he goes, look, he's studying the prophecies. He's studying the prophecies. Help him out. Remove distractions. Get rid of that girlfriend. Come on. Oh, look at this. Here it is. Here it is. Send the hail. Send the hail. Here, yep, here he's going to drive back on. He's in the garage. Oh, the power's gone out. Good. He's sitting there. Okay, here it comes. Here it comes. You ready? Everyone ready? We're waiting 2,000 years for this. Here it is. Okay, change the ones and zeros on that laser. Change it. He's got it. He's got it. He's got it. And all heaven is shouting. So I pray that night. I don't know how to pray, but this is what I say. I said, Jesus, I got it. You're it. You said I'd find you through the word. I found you. Here you are. I got it. Now, I'm all in. I don't know what happens next. 
but I'm all in. You see, that night was my V1. That was the moment that I'm sitting in the captain's seat, because I think I'm the captain like you do. When I'm sitting there, captain of my own life, and the co-pilot, I don't believe he exists. But on this night, I'm in the captain's seat, and the co-pilot reveals himself, Jesus. And he says to me, Robbie, it's V1. You know what I've got to do now, right? I've got two choices. I can either abort and hopefully not crash at the end of the runway, or I can get out of the captain's seat and go, take control and get this thing in the air. And that's what I meant when I said I'm all in. And so Jesus got in the pilot's seat. Jesus said, we're not backing off the thrust in this one. We're going full thrust and we're pulling back and we're airborne. That was like 2002. Now, on the flight that I have been on, there's been some really, really dodgy in-cabin um, service. Some of the hostesses on the flight, who are supposed to be the greeters and, you know, bringing you the help and all that stuff, they're nasty people. But I'm still on the flight because I know who the captain is. And as we go through this flight for the last 20 years, there's been some turbulence. But I just put my seatbelt on when he tells me to and I buckle in and I enjoy the ride. Some people get to that moment and the first time the hostess doesn't give them a smile, they try and take the emergency exit. Some people go, oh, the turbulence, I'm going to die. I've never seen a plane crash yet. And if I do, I won't be telling you about it. Friends, if Jesus is the captain, I can sleep on the plane through turbulence. If Jesus is the captain, I can put up with the really nasty, supposedly vegetarian food that they serve on these flights. I can put up with it. Because I know the captain, and the captain knows me, and he's taken me to my final destination, which is in glory. There's three of you with me, and the rest of you will come later. That was the night that I decided, like I had any choice really, but that's the night that I was aware that I wanted, I needed to be a follower of Jesus. That's the night that I was all in. I said, whatever I've got, you can have it. I don't care. What's, what's a 30-year mortgage? Who cares anyway? What's a, what's a house in Brisbane? Big deal. Brand new car. So what? Working my dream job. I have no fulfillment in writing code and bringing in millions of dollars for a corporation with no real face. I'm all in. Take it. So nothing happened the next day. But by faith, if I could call it that back then, I didn't know it was faith, but by faith I believe that something changed that night. I met Jesus and Jesus met me and I didn't know what was going to happen when I went to work. Guess what happened? The same stuff. I was like, but, but, but where's the thing? Like, isn't there a thing now that I know Jesus? Where's the thing? Maybe it will come tomorrow. I went through the next day. Guess what? Same thing. Nothing. I still had to go to work. I still had to sit next to my South African... No offense to South Africans. But South African, my South African colleagues know how to swear. And I'm like, this stuff's like grating my ear balls now. Yeah, I have ear balls. At five o'clock, we had beer o'clock. Now something grated me about the idea of drinking alcohol. I hadn't been to a single church, especially not yours. My friends who were taking drugs, I'm like, there's something wrong with that now. Because I met Jesus in my living room. But still nothing changed. The life was still the same. I still had the same bill coming every month for the house repayment. I still had to buy fuel for my car. Like nothing changed. And that went on and on and on and on and on for almost a year. And it seemed like the longer it went on, the more depressed I became. Because I'd come home in the evening after working in Brisbane. I'd get home 
uh, I'd sit around my table, I'd open up the Bible, I'd just start like reading because I didn't know what studying necessarily was. I'd just read stuff and I'm like, where are you? You showed me that night you were real, but where are you now? Like, what's the deal? I told you I'll give you everything you want, take it all, what do you want me to do? But nothing happened. But I had nowhere else to go now because now I've had a moment with the supernatural. Where can I go? There's nothing in the, in, in the life that I used to live. Where can I go? So there's, there's a lot more detail. I won't tell it all today because you've got Faith FM on your phone, right? There's an app that should be on your phone. It's called Faith FM Radio. And on there, if you search for the Faith Experiment, you'll find my whole story in great detail. But here's the concluding point I want to share today. About a year later, I had a friend that I met in the course of that year who was a Seventh-day Adventist from Malaysia. Because God knew if he sent you to me, I wouldn't believe you. But he sent a Malaysian, an ex-martial artist. And he was a higher rank than I used to be, and so I had to give him the respect and honor he deserved, even though he didn't practice anymore. And he said to me one night, we knew each other for three months, and he said this to me, he said, God is telling me, as in him, that you are called for ministry. And my response was, well, why didn't he tell me? <laughs> you know, his response was, God works in mysterious ways. <laughs> so I didn't believe that for a second, because I was an introvert. I liked working with technology and problem solving. I didn't like dealing with people, because people are messed up. <laughs> they still are, by the way. It's really hard working with people. That's why being a pastor is the worst job on the earth, because you have to deal with people all day, every day. So I'm like, what, what does even that mean, ministry? What, what does that mean? He's like, you've got to preach Jesus is coming soon to the world. I said, I'm in. I'll do that. I didn't realize you had to chair board meetings <laughs> and run nominating committees and pick the color of carpet in project renovations. Like, That's not what I was signing up for. I was signing up for preaching Jesus is coming back. So anyway, long story short, I lose my job. I get retrenched a year later, uh, after September 11. Why? Because the ANSETs collapsed because of September 11, and because they lost their, their big portfolio, they couldn't afford us, so they outsourced our whole department. 76 programmers got outsourced to India. No offense to the Indians. They all came back 10 years later, but anyway. I lost my job. And Chris lost his job. The guy with the Nostradamus prediction yesterday, he lost his job. We all lost our jobs. After I lost my job, the next day I put my house on the market, the guy laughed at me because it was Christmas time. He said, no one's going to buy over Christmas time. Put it back in, on the market in February. I said, I don't want to. I want to put it on now. He said, I'm not going to do it. I said, why wouldn't you? I've never met a real estate agent that won't list my house. Just put it on. So he did. I get a phone call that afternoon from someone in Western Australia. He said, I don't know. You don't know me. I don't know you, but I heard someone that told me a story about how you became a follower of Jesus and we want you to come to Western Australia over Christmas, New Year's to talk to our young people. I said, I've never been to Western Australia and I just lost my job. And they said, you got a pen? I said, yeah, what for? Write down my credit card number. I'm like, what crazy nutter would give me a credit card number over phone? So I write down the credit card number and they say, book a, a um, what was it, Jet, Jet Blue? Was it Jet Blue? No, not Jet Blue. A blue, uh, Virgin Blue, Virgin Blue. Buy a, <laughs> it's a long time ago, buy a Virgin Blue flight, the cheap one, and then fly out to Western Australia and spend, spend Christmas and New Year's here talking to our young people as we kayak down some river in Western Australia. I'm like, well, I've got nothing else to do. So I did. So I lost my job in the morning. I went to Perth in the evening and I had my house on the market in the middle of the day, all in one day. So I go over there and uh, long story short, you can listen on the podcast, there's a whole lot of detail here, but it all changed my life and I ended up going to 40 countries serving as an evangelist missionary for Jesus and I've passed it now in four countries and here I am. That was the short version. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to take out your phone now and I want to give you a gift that I pray will help you. Take out your phone and I want you to text the code word 
Big 23. Big stands for Big Camp. 23 stands for the year 2023. Big 23, nothing else. That's the number you want to text to. So open up your phone, go to your texting app, go 04888 and I want you to text the code word BIG23. When you text that in, my Faith FM bot that I wrote that's sitting in Melbourne, it's going to get your response and go, hey, nice to meet you, what's your name? You give me the name. Hey, you got an email address? Give an email address. And it will reply to you today, right now, on your phone with, guess what? With Jesus' prayer, but with your name in it. Because I want you to leave here today having an encounter with Jesus. It doesn't matter what Robbie's done. That's none of your business. What matters is, are you with Jesus? Are you all in? Have you given him everything there is to give? Do you know what his glory is like? Have you experienced the Father's love? I hope that the text message you get back from this code word will be something you will treasure. The same way I treasure my Bible version. That's the Robbie translation of the Bible there you just saw. Because that prayer is as valid for you as it was for me. The longing desire of Jesus' heart is for you to be with him. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, you truly are our Father. You loved us before we even knew ourselves. And we have all been a little bit moronic, just like Robbie was. And you have uh, seen our foolishness, our weakness, our sorrows, our triumphs. And you've just been there on the sideline just going, that moment is coming closer. The point of no return is coming closer. It's coming closer. It's coming closer. And for some people today, maybe right now is their V1. I just pray, Father, that you would speak to my friends here through the prayer of Jesus that was prayed for them those 2,000 years ago. Father, be close to us today. Draw us closer to you and prepare us for our deep dive into your word tomorrow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. May God bless you all. We'll see you tomorrow morning at what time? 9.30.